you can hear me well. Coming to you live from uh, the back porch. Coming to you live from the back porch of my the house that we've been living in for the past year and a half. And we are moving. So uh, this is probably the last time I'm going to be, Lord will, and be the last time I'm going to be on this porch. Um, I've been reading in the Word. I've been in John chapter 1, and, and that's where I would love uh, for you to join me this morning. So if you've got your Bible with you, um, then you go ahead and, and be finding the book of John, the Gospel of John, the first chapter. If you're just jumping on, I was saying just a moment ago, we're out here on my back porch, uh, the house that God allowed us to rent for a year and a half. And it's hard to believe that that, has, that time has already come and gone. Good morning, Miss Vera. Good to see you. So glad you're on, um, on this back porch. And this will probably be the last time I'll ever be on it because we are in the process of uh, moving and seeing uh, this house empty was kind of weird. So, But this, this is uh, the home that we've been in for a year and a half, and God's got a different plan for us moving forward. So it's kind of interesting. But um, good, hey, good morning. Good to see you guys jumping on. We're going to look at John chapter number 1, and I hope you'll turn and find it and uh, just get in the Word for a few minutes with us this morning in John chapter 1. Good morning, Miss Alma. Good to see you. I have been amazed... John chapter 1, guys, I, I don't know if you have ever spent much time in John chapter 1. I have memorized John chapter 1 before, and I'm working on re-memorizing uh, it now. Hey, good to see you, Miss Sandy and Miss Carol. Good morning. Good to see you guys. Uh, we're in John chapter 1. I have memorized the text before, and uh, I'm trying to memorize John chapter 1 again. And as I go through John chapter 1... Boy, I tell you, it's just it's hard to overlook a, what I think is a challenge. John chapter number 1 begins with the famous, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And there's a lot of theology there that we can talk about with Jesus Christ, not only His divinity and uh, Him being God, but also the Word. Um, he was the spoken Word at creation. It was His... It was uh, His Word that brought all of this into being. And what a blessing it is to think that it was His Word that said, It is finished at the cross. So there, I could preach, it could go on and on about the Word and uh, creation, all things it says in verse 3, were made by Him. Without Him was not anything made that was made. That answers any question you might have about the Godhead and creation. Verse 4 says, In Him was life. I want to pause for just a moment on the second part of verse 4 because I think it's important to know that in Jesus' life, we know that I think pretty well. Uh, the Word of God says later in John chapter 10 that He has come to give life, abundant life. We have an enemy called a thief that comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But the Good Shepherd is giving abundant life. It is the second part of verse 4, though, that I really want to talk about for just a moment. The life was the light of men. The light of men. I believe in our world it is certainly no accident that things feel really dark right now. And they don't just feel dark for, for believers. Uh, this isn't just a dark time for the church. It, you could very well be an atheist today and you would notice how dark this world feels. We might be seeing the darkness in different ways and in different perspectives, but I don't think you're going to have much of an argument from anybody. Buddhist, Hindu, Christian, atheist, most everyone would agree today there's a lot of darkness in our world. Verse 4 says Jesus in him was even where life is. He's the creator. His word is creation. But in his life is where light is. If you take away Jesus Christ from the equation, you are literally turning the light out. I don't use the word literally there just because it's a word we've said more and more over the past couple of decades. I mean that. You are turning out the light of this world. 
when you push Jesus out of the equation. Verse 5 says, the light shines in darkness. The darkness comprehends it not. It's a very interesting passage. Darkness doesn't struggle to comprehend light usually. Darkness seems to have a pretty good grip on the effect and the power and the purpose of light. Darkness succumbs to light. Darkness retreats in the presence of light. But in this world, in this age, this darkness will see light and refuse it. In so much that Paul wrote in Corinthians that the God of this world, that's an interesting phrase, he's talking about Satan, the God of this world has blinded their minds that they would not comprehend this light, the gospel of Jesus Christ. I said all that to get to what I believe God really wants me to say. There was a man, verse 6, sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness. What was his witness? Verse 7, to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. When they say that all men through him might believe, they're referring to the light. Jesus. Verse 8 is the verse that really stands out to me, and I want to challenge you with it. Talking about John the Baptist, verse 8 makes this clarification. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That's the true light, which lights every man that cometh into the world. Boy, I just can't help but not read the next three verses, so we'll read them and then come back. He was in the world, the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Why did the Apostle John, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, clarify <laughs> in verse 8, that John the Baptist was not that light. You know, so often we operate under this premise of, well, I'm not Jesus. I'm sorry. I'm just, don't expect too much out of me. I'm not God. I'm not Jesus. John the Baptist, completely human and not divine in any way. Not divine in any way. He was clarified to not be that light. That is how bright the light inside of John was shining. John was such a glowing example of eternal life that, that the gospel writer had to clarify. He was not that light. He was just bearing witness of the light. He was just radiating the light. He was just reflecting the light. In fact, if you go down to verse 19, the Jews send priests and Levites to, from Jerusalem to ask John, who are you, dude? John, the gospel writer, in verse 20 says, he confesses. He doesn't deny it. He confesses, I am not the Christ. They asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? He said, no. Are you the prophet? He said, no. They said unto him, verse 22, well, well, who are you so that we can give an answer back to those who sent us? What do you say of yourself? Verse 23, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord. I said the prophet Isaiah. John, <laughs> John had such a glow about him. He had such a power about him. He had such a presence about him. He had such an impact that he had to answer the question, I am not the light, but I'm reflecting the light. I think we've retreated, church, I really do. I think in our society, in our culture, I think over the past several, maybe hundreds of years, we've retreated. I think we are known more for who we follow on sports teams. I think we're known more for what kind of cars we drive. I think we're more interested a lot of times and a lot more passionate about our politics, a lot more passionate about 
our opinions on financial things and investments and retirement and what boat we want to buy. I think people know us a lot more for the purses that uh, maybe some of us, uh, some of our ladies are interested in buying or the, the type of hairdos that we're trying to get or I think as men a lot of times maybe the, the type of hunting that we prefer, what lure we use and fishing. I think we're known um, by the type of personalities that we have and I think those around us know a whole lot about us. But sadly, I think for many of us, most all of us, no one is coming to us and saying, what is this light? What's this light that's shining off of you? I say this to our shame, I say it to my shame, and I wanna challenge you today that this concept that we've so quickly adopted of, I'm not Jesus, I'm not God, I, you don't expect me to be perfect, I'm just a sinner, and you know, thank God I'm saved by grace, and, Obviously, all that's true. As, as a young person might say, duh, of, of course we're not Jesus. Of course we're not perfect. Of course don't look at us to be perfection. But as Paul said, be imitators of me. As John had to clarify, I'm not that light. Let me point you to who is the light. That ought to be true of us. We ought to be so radiant. We ought to be so shiny today that folks are coming and saying who are you what 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 are you what is the deal with you you're weird not weird because of some belief that we hold that's crazy and out there not weird because of some rules we've attached to ourselves that aren't even in the bible not weird because we're trying to be weird Weird because the light shines in darkness and the darkness comprehends it not. Weird because there's a special light shining through us that a co-worker sees and says, I want. I want to share a little story with you and then I want us to pray. We met as a, a youth group, kind of a private, small thing. We wasn't widely announced. Truthfully, my intention was for it to just be our our youth group that's been there. Didn't really didn't want necessarily visitors. Wasn't uh, trying for it to be a big thing. wasn't a secret per se, but just wanted our group to come and share their story. And I wanted it kind of to be more of an intimate group, so they'd feel comfortable to share. And and it was. It was a pretty small group. It was an awesome group of people. But but one young lady did bring a friend. And that was fine, it wasn't against the rules. And the young people began to share their testimonies. And this, this, uh, this young lady that was there visiting noticed and later told her friend, I'll, I'll keep some of that private, but essentially this friend that was visiting told her friend that attends our youth group, attends our church, she said, there's just something different. There's just a joy, there's just a, it was just something different. I don't think she used the term light, but it, it would be a synonym to what she was saying. There's just a light. There's a joy, a difference. And I want to make sure that I have it. Church, that's what it does. That's what the gospel does. That's what the light does. And God has been so convicting my heart about the things that I pour into and the my my hobbies and, and the things that I love to track. A lot of you know I'm I've always enjoyed political science and elections and campaigns. I follow those. I've, uh, even as a high schooler, I worked in a campaign uh, briefly just to help as a volunteer. Just since high school, just have loved politics. But I just pour so much time into that. I, I just be honest with you. I'm done. I, I'm I am done uh, immersing myself in things and taking away my focus and the priority of the Word of God and the gospel. I can't do that anymore. And sports has been that for me. My mom warned me. My mom warned me over and over and over again. She said, David, if you do not bridle uh, your affection to sports, it's going to control you. It's going to dominate your mind. And I found myself in my 20s spending hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of dollars that I didn't have so that I could go watch games that would have no eternal difference. So I still enjoy politics. I still enjoy sports. I, I'm going to have to continue to fight those battles. But what I'm saying to you is, what is it for you? 
What is the light of this world that's shining brighter in your eye? What gets your eyes twinkling more than the gospel? What gets your heart beating quicker and faster more so than the gospel? What do you get more passionate about in this world more than the gospel? Let it be said of us by our co-workers, our neighbors, our family members. Let it be said of us. They have light shining all over them. And may the world say, I want that. Lord, I ask you that you would continue, Lord Jesus, to reveal. And I'm thankful. I'm so thankful that though we get so sidetracked and our eyes get... Uh, so blinded by the things of this world that you're, you're patient with us, you're slow to anger, that you love us, that you continue to meet with us and to convict us. I'm so thankful that you're doing that work in my heart. I know you're doing it in the heart of our church. So much stuff in this world that we could be encumbered with. So much uh, things in this world that we l leisure, as the preacher preached about on Sunday, to play, to entertain. We get so overcome with our next vacation, with our hobbies, with our media, with the things that we like to watch or do or follow. And so I pray, God, that you would continue to prune us and that you would continue to reprove us and put us to the fire. God, we don't like it, but we need it. And I pray, God, that what you would do at Clearview and at the Church of God around the world and others, God, I know who are watching, is what I pray you would do is increase John 3 30 that I would decrease and you would increase that others would ask me who are you dude what are you and I'd say I'm just pointing to Jesus I'm just pointing to the one who can change your life do this work I pray in Jesus name amen and amen I love you guys. I'm praying for you. And I will see you on Wednesday night.